said something before I got going on this, um, and that is last week I talked about the uh, I talked about the um, the awakening there and the spiritual awakening there in the early 1900s. I was thinking how I made it sound. I didn't want you guys to think that the Reformed Church got going from that. Okay, I just simply was saying that the Pentecostal movement has impacted the rest of the churches. Is all I was getting at. So I don't want you guys to think that Reformed Church is like a... So, anyways. Um, <clears throat> where's my Bible? Check on the other side. <coughs> this is my Bible now. Um, so we are talking about the woes of knowledge. And next week we are talking about the minister who quit, which is very fun. Yeah. Uh, because it is a pastor who quit being a pastor because, um, you know, he just found too many problems with the Bible. And so we're going to look at his top ten things that he, that he wrote about, and we're going to dissect them and show that how he's wrong about them. Hooray! Uh, Are we going to write him a letter? No. <laughs> no, but the thing is, the thing is that I, I'm continually getting disturbed by the Methodist Church as a whole. Um, they are producing inferior scholars and inferior pastors. Um, and I think that this really should be a word of warning for us in the Assemblies of God because if the Methodist can, can this can happen to the Methodist Church, like it could happen to the AG Church too. Um, I, I'm seeing uh, lately a lot of Methodist scholars are you know condoning a, of sexual sins that, that, that the Bible clearly talks uh, talks against. They are, um, you know, it seems like the overall they've become very skeptical. Um, a lot of the, the Methodist scholars have become skeptical of the Bible and these kinds of things, and it's like. Well, you know, for whatever reason, they're stopping shy of, of full study and just taking all the different things that seem like threats to the churches, you know. Now, I don't want to make it sound like the Methodist church in total. I'm just saying um, I, I've run into a lot of Methodist scholars recently who've done this. The Me I'm not saying anything against the Methodist church themselves, so. Um, or I'm not intending to, let me say it like that. Mm. So we, we've talked about knowledge over the past, you know, two years. Last year we talked about Bible study. This year we've talked about things like cults and, and um, uh, apologetics and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I wanted to kind of show the, the flip side of that. Um, and that's, you know, taking knowledge to an extreme that it doesn't necessarily need to go. And so the first danger associated with, with, with knowledge is the rabbit hole. Um, this is this is what happens when you start studying and you just keep studying and you just go to these dark areas of knowledge. Um, like for instance, this there could have been an, an old earth between Genesis one and Genesis two, and Genesis 1, Genesis one one and Genesis one two or whatever. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about here. And so they just start studying and they start making stuff up, and because you can't absolutely disprove it. They, they, they take it, and that's just how it is. And then they'll go to other places like that part, and I think it's like Daniel or some nonsense like that, um, and they'll start taking places to reaffirm that view that they held. And because you can't absolutely disprove it, they'll take it that that means that it's fact. See what I mean? And so they just get into this like rabbit hole, you know, where they just and, and they can't see their, their own way out of it because the knowledge is actually blinding them from it. So overthinking everything. Um, like say you start studying Jehovah's Witness, and then you start believing it because you just fall short of full... Um, full um, inspection, I guess you could say. You know what I mean? Falling short of, of, of fully uh, studying the thing. Um, another th thing is falling in a sea of confusion. You know, with your philosophy, your worldview gets a little bit twisted. Like, let's say you're you're studying Buddhism and you start seeing how it applies to your life more than you saw how your religion applied to your life. See what I mean? And so you just get into this place that's just very ambiguous for you in here, and you start to get a little bit confused by it. Um, um, like, for instance, relativism. If you don't really study that all the way through, you're going to be in a very confused place, you know. Um, also, uh, being a walking encyclopedia with no application. You know everything about everything. You can answer everybody's, everybody's problems. You, you have something to say about every little thing that's, that's being said. And that's it. See what I mean? Like, you don't ever have, you're not even ever there for people. You're not ever compassionate towards people. You've got all the problems solved. See what I mean? Um, uh, for those of you who have gone to college, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, me, you, you. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, did you go to college? 
A little bit, yeah. For a little bit. So you just, kind of know what I'm talking about. Some professors, yeah. especially at MSUA, are kind of like this. Yeah, I went there yeah. for Especially uh, any time that there's a philosophy professor, usually they'll be like this. Yeah. They'll be so into it that they're just... Mm. Anyways, um, um, but okay, uh, drawing false conclusions and developing blind spots. You know, you, you start to study, but you, you, you block yourself off from other people. And so you, you you just assume that this is how something is, you know what I mean? And so you just start drawing these conclusions when it's like, well, now hold on, you know what I mean? You see, we see Richard Dawkins do this a lot. You know, he's become so anti-Bible, anti-church, and everything, anti-God, that he rushes to, to 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 conclusions on things, and it's like, well, now hold on, there's a few different things that could easily qualify for that. This, like for instance, with, with with evolution, you know, oh, this this is well, okay. What about this? What about this? You know, what I mean, there's so many things he doesn't take into account, um, but rushes to a, to an easy conclusion, and he's blinded himself from any other possibility just because he's got the knowledge and this is the solution. See what I mean? Um, um, not realizing all human reasoning will ultimately fall short. It doesn't matter how smart you are, your knowledge will eventually fall short somewhere. I have definitely learned that over the past year. Definitely learned that. Um, it, it's it's not something where you know I'm just this really smart person, so I'm never going to have any problems with it. I'm just going to understand everything. Not like that. Um, definitely, definitely not like that. Um, <clears throat> so the inability to stop or recover from from this, I already, I already talked about that. Um, any questions about this first danger or any comments? A quiet bunch tonight, huh? I want you guys to occasionally at least chuckle or something. Chuckle. Uh, because this goes on the internet. I don't want people to think that I'm actually just talking to myself. <laughs> Thank God. They laughed. Now you got a laugh track. <laughs> laugh track? Oh my gosh, no. Um, so the second danger is sorrow or hopelessness, depression, that kind of stuff. Um, for that, I'm going to turn to Ecclesiastes 118. And I'm not trying to take this passage like far out of what was meant by it. Um, I just kind of trying to get an idea going. Um, For in much wisdom is, is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Um, there's this idea of you know seeing things clearly. You know what I mean? Like I don't know how to describe it, but people don't like to see things clearly. They like to be at least a little bit blind towards things. You know what I mean? They, they, they don't want to know full deep. They think that they do, but then when they do, they you know they they realize that they actually don't really want to. You know, um, and so w the more you gain knowledge, the more you start seeing things clearly, and you start seeing from a different perspective, and you start understanding things in a way that you never understood it before. You know what I mean? And as a result, sometimes it can be very depressing. You know, like let's say the 18-year-old who realizes how short life is. The um, you know, 30-something year old. Yeah, I'm I'm sure, I'm sure you get what I'm saying without me going on a bunch of examples. But you know, um, just that 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 idea, you know, that um, like let's say um, I don't know, you just understand something. I, I'm sure you guys have all reached this place in something with your life before. Um, but anyways, uh, the inability to keep the motions in check. Um, I don't really want to get into that one. Um, you know, sometimes as, as we gain a knowledge, um, we lack somewhere else. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, it's not uncommon for an extremely smart professor to be extremely short-tempered. That's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for somebody who works really hard to not be overly smart. See what I mean? It's, these things aren't uncommon. Um, because people, generally speaking, have an area of expertise. You know what I mean? And and for some people who who make knowledge their area of expertise, um, they become kind of withdrawn from people or unable to relate to people or n not compassionate. I hope you see what I'm kind of saying here. They they have an inability to keep that emotion in check. Um, um, also, fear uh, knowledge can knowledge can can cause you know in this aspect here can cause a lot of fear. Um, you know, understanding how things are, um, understanding how, like for instance, understanding that, that that safety is something that isn't really 
Like, when you were a kid, you know, you thought that everything's safe. You know, the government's safe, everybody wants to protect you and everything. Then you grow up and you start realizing the people around you. Then you start realizing how fragile your government is. Then you start realizing how quickly your government could be overtaken by other world powers. You know what I mean? And the more you start paying attention to these things, the more fearful you get. Because with that knowledge brought the realization, which brought fear. See what I mean? Um, it, it, so what does it say? Ignorance is bliss? Yeah. See what I mean? And this is just this idea that, you know, everything's okay as long as you don't know about it. Something could could be happening all of a sudden that, that you didn't know there was happening, but as soon as you know it's happening, all of a sudden it's a big deal. You know what I mean? Like for instance, um, the, uh, the husband who you know is just going to work back and forth, then finds out that, that his wife you know got and got addicted to drugs that he didn't even know about. See what I mean? And all of a sudden it's like ah, well she's been on it for six months. Well yeah, I just didn't know about it then. You know what I mean? So I'm sure you guys see what I'm saying though. Um, also with that comes that conclusion of pointlessness. You know. <laughs> Um, with a lot of knowledge, sometimes you just come to this conclusion that you know it's it's pointless. I can't I can't do anything to change the world because you you know you start to see how things are in the world and how they've been for a long time in the world and you start saying I can't do anything to change it, uh, and then you just get to this place of why even live? You know what I mean? And so it's just this circular circular thing that happens. And, and I fully believe, me personally believe, that it's because man can only handle so much knowledge in his brain. That I not my personal opinion. Before the guy can explode. <laughs> anyway, so. But you know what I'm saying? We're 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 you study and you study and, and you get to the point of just like you know what I mean? Like how many people do you know that are really smart at technology and theology and this other thing and philosophy and you know what I mean? Normally they focus in on one area, you know what I mean? And your brain can't really like for instance people who are really good at like say let's say geometry or algebra aren't necessarily good with philosophy or physics. See what I mean? I personally believe that the human brain is incapable of handling too much information. You know what I mean? And I think that goes kind of hand in hand with this. The more you increase that knowledge, think of it as like um, uh, streaming Wi-Fi and your signal just is, is drawing too much download off of it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so anyways. Um, um, so then there's, you know, obviously throughout Ecclesiastes, as it warns about, without balance of God, the knowledge doesn't satisfy. You know, you just kind of just this place of hopelessness. Um, not to say that anything's wrong with knowledge or acquiring wisdom and all these different things, but um, once again, um, without that balance of God, that it just becomes a pointless task. You know, like, once again, talking about Richard Dawkins, let's say he's right and there's no God, then why does it even matter and why is he on such a personal vengeance against Christianity? You know what I mean? Why does it matter if, if there's no God and we, we don't, nothing happens after death and all these things? Who cares? Let people live in their delusion and you go live in your delusion. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter ultimately. Right. Not only that, but time is awful short. Do you really want to waste it doing something like that? Don't you want to go do something you enjoy? Travel the world? Do something? Give to the poor? Do something? And instead, you know, he's taking this personal vengeance. Like, well, let's say that you're true. It's completely pointless. So, any questions about that one? I don't want to have a have a monologue tonight. <laughs> Anybody have anything to add or ask or anything? Anything? You're all terrible, all of you. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll edit that out. Um. So the third danger is the knowledge is knowledge over love, which frequently happens with younger pastors. Um, you know, they get out of Bible school and they think they can conquer the world, and they start making changes and forget about why they're making the changes, <laughs> and it becomes an all-consuming pursuit about this this idea of perfection that they get in their head, and then it never arrives, and they're always striving for it, and then eventually they just lose sight of the people if they ever had sight of the people. You know, um, like I was talking with Pastor today, and he was saying about this this professor that he had when he was in Bible college, and how he w everybody didn't like him because he was very difficult, a very difficult professor. And but he told Dad, you know, he said, you know, the reason why is because I ex people are come here and they think that ministry is just going to be a breeze. So they come in and and they and they only do a, a half half done job with with their school, and they think that they're going to be able to make it in ministry. No. So what I do is I equip them for it by making them study in order to pass my class. Yeah. Well, that's awful yeah. smart. You know, that's a good yeah. idea. What happens when you become a pastor? You have to do a bunch of things that you don't know how to, how to do. <laughs> you, you have to study all the time while making time for people all the time. See what I mean? Right. He's preparing them for that before they get there. Um, no, I think he's dead now, but, you know, uh, he was preparing them for that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. 
This passage is often taken out of context uh, out of context to say that we shouldn't study. But that's definitely not what he's talking about. Is in first or second Timothy, Paul says, you know, study to show yourself approved, and in other places, you know, all these different things. Plus, God gave us an entire Bible so that we could study. So I think that maybe he wants us to study. You know what I mean? If he didn't want us to study, he wouldn't have given us a Bible. You know what I mean? So, uh, First Corinthians eight one. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This is what was going on. The Corinthians were saying basically some, not all of them, but some of them were saying something along the lines of this. Now we know that there aren't actually any other gods besides God. Therefore, it's okay for me to eat the food sacrificed to these other gods because they don't even exist. So then Paul writes. All of us possess that knowledge. However, this knowledge is puffing you up. Love, however, uh, the word here uh, builds up in, in the ESV, uh, encourages, it watches out for someone else's benefit. Um, in other words, well, okay, you know that, but does your brother know that? See what I mean? And so you're doing something that is offending your brother and leading him to sin. So love is ca it would cause you to see that person, whereas your knowledge is causing you to see the answer. Does that make sense? And oftentimes we do this exact same thing, you know, we have it all, um, um, like I wrote down a few examples. Um, I know it's not wrong. I don't have time for, time for the, for this, for the stupid thing. I know what's right. <laughs> These idiots just don't understand. And I know we laugh, but, but how many times have you been in this place? Where and I'm laughing too because I've been in this place, you know, where you're arguing with somebody and you want to do something and you just think, you know, I can get away with it. You know, I, I know, I know, you know what I mean. I, I know what, what what's good and what's not good, um, and so you just kind of forget the purpose of knowledge. And with this danger, you know, you focus so much on knowledge that you don't have love to balance it. You know what I mean? It's like freedom without law. Do you know what freedom without law means? Persecution, bondage. Because if everybody's doing what they feel like, that's absolute freedom. You can't have absolute freedom. You need the check of, of law. See what I mean? Otherwise, you won't be absolutely free because, like, well, let's say the person across the street, being absolutely free, decides to rob from me. Well, I have the freedom to do so. See what I mean? Freedom needs the balance of, of law, right? In the same way, knowledge needs the balance of love. Does that make sense? Because knowledge without love just gets carried away into nothing. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> reaching a logical conclusion over a loving conclusion. I'll give you three examples. Tattoos. You could go around and around and around about whether tattoos are good or bad. So I will, I will do that so you guys can understand. Leviticus says not to get tattoos. Okay, yes, but it's not talking about actual, you know, the tattoos like we have to today. Plus, we're not bound to the Old Testament uh, law. Yes, but you shouldn't do something to offend your brother. Yes, but I shouldn't live only for my brother because then I would be only doing what everybody else wants instead of what God wants. Yes, but you see how it's a circular argument? You can just keep going around and around and around. Ultimately, what it comes down to is your <coughs> specific context, your specific conscience. See what I mean? Ultimately, what it comes down to. Um, e even though... You know, tattoos isn't what was originally being talked about in Leviticus. It has become that. So in a way, we have to respond differently than the Bible originally mended, meant, intended. Does that make sense? So I'm sure you sing the you can go way you can go back and forth on that one. Um, and when you're reaching reaching that conclusion, how easy is it to reach the logical conclusion? Well, whichever one is logical for you, you know, because remember, reason is something that is very biased a lot of times. You know, I don't think that the tattoos are wrong so that, see what I mean so therefore you're going to justify it well let's say I do think the tattoos are wrong and then I'm going to justify that see I'm getting that right do you want to give me that um and with that being said you know it's easy to reach that logical conclusion it's right or it's not right rather than that loving conclusion should I do this right. and it's the exact same thing with finances not can I do this but should I do this you know how many times do we do we just spend money without asking should I really spend my money on this right. you know what I mean oh, yeah. you guys know what I mean right um for instance, how many times do we even think about it? Um, you know, and I'm not trying to. I understand. I'm not trying to condemn anybody here. Okay, I'm just using this as an example. When I was in college, um, you know, whenever a new iPhone would come out, these college students that didn't even have money to pay off their 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 school bill would take their money and go buy the brand new iPhone. 
or use their loan money. Or use their loan money. Their loan I mean, money. just a completely oh, yeah. un. First off, the government or whoever loaned it to you loaned it to you for the sake of your school. If you're not going to pay your school, you better give it back. So I mean, that's that's school loans. You, you see, what I mean, that that's that's the moral thing to do. Um, if, if let's say if I if I loan Zach money to buy a car and he goes out and goes gambling with it, I'm going to be offended, right? Mm -hmm. Because he wasted my money on something that's not even going to help him. I mean, unless he won a million dollars, in which case, hey, buy me a car too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, 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 I'm getting off topic. But you see what I'm saying? The loving conclusion versus the logical conclusion. Um, another thing is is the sacrifice meat, which is exactly what First Corinthians is talking about. Another thing is alcohol. Okay, so the traditional Christian response, don't drink, right? Which is funny because as we talked about, I think it was last week, Christmas became a time for people to get drunk. So I thought that – anyways, uh, off topic again. Um, um, alcohol. Okay, so the traditional Christian you know, answer, you know, don't, don't drink. Well, then the people who say, okay, you can drink, but you can't get drunk, and then the people who abuse that. So then the people go back, well, what about conscience? And they bring up the same argument here to substitute sacrifice meat for alcohol. Um, and you know, then you, they go back and forth about this, rather than the loving conclusion, regardless of whether alcohol runs in your family. Is this a good thing to do? You know what I mean? See what I mean? Just at, stopping it and actually long enough, killing your, the lust of what you want to do for long enough to just simply ask the question, but should I do this? You know, it's not wrong to go into debt to buy a house, for instance, but always ask, should I buy this house? So I mean, sometimes, for instance, um, I, I knew one person who was in such a hurry to buy a house that they drastically overpaid, and then the next month, a better house went on the market for way cheaper. See what I mean? If they would have just at, prayed and asked God rather than just blowing the money, see what I mean? And that's what I'm talking about. Not being in such a rush to get things the way that we want, where we slow, where we're slow enough to respond to say, okay, but, but should I do this? And if I should do this, should I do it right now? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> also, this hand in hand with this, you get into a place of being alone in your principles. You know, it's you versus the world. You, everybody else is wrong, and you're right. And you just become, you get this, you get this very arrogant spirit, this very prideful attitude to you. You know what I mean? And y you. Holier than thou. Yeah, uh, holier than you, thou. Yeah, it, it, you, you just get this, uh, this mindset that everybody else is an idiot. And you've got it all figured out, and nobody else does. They're all just blind morons. See what I mean? And especially, you don't know how many times I see this with government. Oh, I, I know how to fix the government if the government would just do this. Okay. Yeah, sure. See what I mean? And it's, it, it's getting around voting time, so you're going to hear this a lot more lately, especially on places like Facebook and YouTube. Well, Donald Trump this, and Hillary Clinton this, and it's like, uh, I could not tell you how much I don't care. If I had a book of a thousand-page book, I couldn't tell you how much I don't care. I just, in fact, I don't even care enough to write that thousand-page book. Uh, but anyways, just getting that idea of being loftier, um, just, and it's a very subtle thing. A lot of times, you don't even realize it's happening. You know what I mean? You just stop loving people one day. You know what I mean? It's just it's this gradual thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, people think that you know, you just wake up one day and and your love is gone. No. No. No, no. Uh, how it happens is very subtly. Let's say you care about people. Well, things come up. Um, the, the traditional things that get us to stop loving people. Hurt. Somebody wrongs you. Um, something else steals your attention or love. Like, you know, uh, what I see around here, pets, video games, sports. I know there's something else. Oh, uh, alcohol. Uh, that's what I see a lot out here. Um, any questions about this one? I tried to... But if I could just say something... Please do, please! <laughs> I, I think um, as far as, you know, saying that, that people who say things like, this, the president, okay, the president sucks, and I could run this country so much better. Well, you always hear that People who have never done something before are always the experts. <laughs> like People the new parents? Kids are experts <laughs> right? in parenting. I wouldn't let my kids do that because you don't know if you've actually done it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's where knowledge comes in. Mm. You know? And, and and then when we have the knowledge of something, well, uh, not to sound like 
redundant, but you have to use that knowledge wisely. Hmm. You, you know what I mean? You, you have to be yeah. discerning with your knowledge, and, and that's where love comes in on, on how to yeah. put that knowledge to good use, yeah. for good and not evil. You know, so. Okay, Peter Parker. He's <laughs> <laughs> channeling my inner Spider-Man. Uh, but, yeah, I just wanted to. That, that no, and I think, think of that. I think there, there, there's a few things that Serena said that, that were actually pretty important things. The difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah, I think that's pretty important to emphasize. You know, knowledge is knowing something, but wisdom is knowing how to use that something. You know, um, and the discretion that she was talking about. You know, knowledge without wisdom is, is an encyclopedia. It's a book. You know, I think that was that was very important. Um, and there was something else that you were saying, um, that I actually lost my train of thought, uh, I said that the people who have not done something, oh yes, yes, actually. and then there's a difference between knowledge and experience, right, for instance, Paul was never married, but he knew a lot about marriage, mm -hmm. and he taught us a lot about marriage in, in, in his epistles, right, uh -huh. but he never experienced it, see what I mean, so you can have knowledge, and you can think that you have knowledge, but experience clarifies what was actual knowledge and what was just your arrogant pretensions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, like with the example she was talking about, sticking with this theme, I, I really like that theme. The new parent, you know, oh, yeah. they know everything that's right for their like, right for their baby, everything. I mean, everything, everything. Don't even bother because they they know, they know. And then they get to be about you know, um, I don't know, forties I guess, and they're like, wow, I don't know as much as I thought I did. And then you get to be about 60s and they're like, hey, it's not my problem anymore. Grandkids, woo! <laughs> <laughs> you want to make a parent mad. If you're not a parent, tell them how to parent. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. I make them very mad. Exactly. I hated that. I, especially as a new mom. Because I'm like, wait, I need, I need, you know, I need guidance and stuff. But not from you. Right. <laughs> no, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because, oh, yeah. you know, as a pastor, when someone comes up to you and be like, welcome to, parent, to pastoring. And it's like... I never pastored. <laughs> you don't know what you're, you're talking a about. You're, you're a plumber. I saw you pulling a turd out of a toilet. What are you That's talking you about? Welcome to plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you all close off your sermon. Welcome to plumbing. <laughs> Just drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> but yes, the difference between knowledge and experience and the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Someday we should really get into that. Um, but good comments. And thank God. See, people watching on the, or listening on the internet, I'm not alone here. <laughs> okay, so the fourth danger, arrogance or bitterness, which, yeah, as you can kind of see, some of these really go along hand in hand with each other. Uh, Proverbs 26.16. Excuse me, I burped. The slugger is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The slugger is wiser in his own eyes. He's got it all figured out. Than seven men who can answer sensibly. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're that person, you know what I mean. If you've met that person, you know what I mean. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> where they, <laughs> yeah, where, where they, um, you know, they, they just have everything figured out about everything. They've got a comment for everything. You know, they've got, they've got it all figured out. You my know what brother. I'm talking about. Yeah, you, I, I see the look in your face. My brother's <laughs> like that. I'm the one that my brother's is like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. uh, and then Proverbs 12.1. I hope it's 12.1. Yes. I think this is the one I wrote the wrong verse on. No! No! It does say knowledge in there. Whoever loves discipline... Lo okay, yes, loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Basically what Proverbs is saying is the person who says, you know... who's Okay. Have you ever heard somebody try to tell you something, mm -hmm. and you get mad and don't listen? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That's being a fool. Have you ever been the person who just listened to what they were listened to what their person was saying, even though you heated their face and you just want to punch them in the face? That was the wise person. Yeah. See what I mean? And that's what Proverbs shows, especially with this verse: Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Not only because they didn't receive the reproof so that they could learn and be smart, but because it's a stupid thing. When, when somebody's trying to help you, even if they're doing it from an arrogant heart, even if they're wrong, at least there'll be a kernel of truth somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, as much as I hate it, that person who said that about pastoring, they knew a few things here and there. You know what I mean? Just because with life comes, what's that word Serena said? 
the experience. Because uh-huh. with life comes experience. Even if they haven't done that, even if they have not been a pastor, they still have something where if I can just look past my pride to listen to them for five seconds, I might learn something. Might <laughs> learn something. Now, obviously, the thing is, is you have to take it with a grain of salt. Because you'll get people who, like Serena was talking about, who just know everything about everything. You know, and you have to have enough patience to sit there listening to them go on and on for the 15 minutes before you can actually shift through it to figure out if there's anything that you could actually learn from. But if there is, there'll be that one kernel of nugget that you would have missed, or nugget of, uh, of, of, of knowledge that you would have missed because of how irritated you were with them. And I'm not talking to you guys, I'm talking to me. Um... And this idea of, you know, my ways are always right. I don't need your instruction because I just already know, or I, you know, I know best. Um, um, you're wrong. Before I've ever, and before I've heard you speak, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. Uh, where somebody starts talking and you instantly have their problem solved. You have any, they haven't even said their first sentence and you're like, I got it. No, no, <laughs> stop talking. No, shut up. I got, I, I, no, seriously, shut up. I've got your, your solution here. It's on the tip of my tongue. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. You? Yeah. You know what I mean. I know what you mean. You know what I mean. Uh-huh. But especially you. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, prayerfully consider it. Because this is what happens. Somebody says something and either we hate them, we hate what they said, or we hate how they said it. And so we don't listen to them. Well, Proverbs just told us that that was a foolish person. That person's very stupid. So, I mean, so we want to gain in wisdom, we want to gain in character. And so the thing to do, which is not exactly the easiest thing to do, because it's usually about something very irritating, like like the example that Serena gave, where it's like, okay, I'm a parent, and you've never even had kids. Why are you talking? You know, but with that being said, as irritating as it is, sometimes they will actually say something that makes sense. And once again, because we're so close to our problems, we can't see it. So even though we hate the source, be it their ugly face or their ugly voice or their <laughs> ugly, ugly self, um, you know, prayerfully consider it. You know what I mean? Take it with a grain of salt and just pray about it. And I'm not saying pray about it in that way. I'm saying pray about it where you actually ask the Lord to show you your heart. Um, I'm never wrong and I can't stand it when someone assumes I am. <laughs> we don't say it like that, but we say it like that in here. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the cure. Let's talk about the cure to, 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 to one-sided knowledge. First off, remembering where you came from. Jeremiah 1.5 says this. So in all your studies with you know the different cults and everything, remember this 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 um, summation here. Um, not summation, this conclusion. Um, One five says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. You know, remember where you came from. Remember, you know, God brought me here. God accomplished these things in me. You know what I mean? Um, with remember, without God, you're whatever you were before. A drunkard, a cheat, a liar, you, whatever those things were that you did before, that's who you were. That's what defined you. Now, Chris Talman has his new song, you know, you're a good, good father, it's who you are. And he says, um, I am loved by you, it's who, it's who I am. Do you see what he's saying? And he's saying, everything that makes me me is based solely off the love of God. That's what he's saying. I just said it in an elaborated way. But that's exactly, you see what I mean? As Christians, we draw our, our character from that. So remember where you came from. Don't get arrogant in your position. I see this happen a lot. God raises some people up and, and bears them into a family that, that, that has money. And so as a result, they tend to have this idea that if you just work hard enough, you'll eventually get up in life. You'll climb the ladder. Well, what happens when you go to Ethiopia and they never have that opportunity? See what I mean? All of a sudden, this biased worldview that you had is suddenly shattered. Whatever happens when you go to the streets of Detroit and you see the people living in that filth, see what I mean? And your tune starts changing. It's hard to look at the hurting in the world and say honestly that they could just simply pick themselves up by their bootstraps. See what I mean? It doesn't matter. Come on. No. Um, and, and so remembering where you came from. God made some rich and he made some poor. And whereas some people choose to be poor simply because they're lazy or because they don't want to get a job or those kinds of things, it's 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 never a wise thing to forget you know these different things and like what Jesus said there'll always be poor among you you know remember these things don't forget where you came from if you have you have so you can give um, I'm obviously not talking about socialist socialist government I'm not even talking about government at all but there's always that one person who think makes everything about politics so I want to clarify um, so remember where you came from 
Uh, secondly, uh, prayer and scripture. Stay in the word and stay in prayer. Psalm 23. Where am I? Here I am. Psalm 23 says this. I think it's 119, around like 6 or 12 or something. He says, how can the young man keep his way pure? He says, by meditating on, on your word. Um, so Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is he talking about here? See what I mean? Stay in the word and stay in prayer. It's just a di you, your mindset changes. Like people going through panic attacks. You, know, you, you say things like, okay, every day get up, take a shower, shave. And they say, well, that's not. How is that going to help me with panic attacks? Well, first off, as you get that disciplined mindset, you're, you're, you, you start thinking differently. You know what I mean? And you're able to control your thoughts better. See what I mean? If you sleep in all day, you sleep into tw 12 in the afternoon, you play video games all day, you do this, you're going to have a very irresponsible mindset. You're not going to have a disciplined mi mindset because you're not di being disciplined in your sleeping patterns, your eating ha ha habits, your um, your 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 entertainment or or, or um, off time habits. You're not you don't have a disciplined lifestyle, so your mind is not going to be disciplined. It's going to think about whatever the heck it wants to think about. It's like people who are worried about something and they can't stop worrying about it because you haven't been trained. God is training you in righteousness. You haven't been prepared for this. So you are now growing so that you will be able to in the future stop worrying. See what I mean? God brings us to situations that we can't stop worrying so that we learn the character so that in the future we can stop worrying. The problem is, in our McDonald's mindset, we want something here and now. We want God to, what does Pastor say last week or the week before? Open up our heads and just put it on in there. Yeah. Like, God, give me peace. Okay, <laughs> That's not how God works. What does First Corinthians three uh, one three through eleven say? You who are given comfort and says that so you can go and give comfort to others. Why doesn't the Holy Spirit just give comfort to everybody? Because He sent us to do that. Does that make sense? It's the exact same way. Stay in the Word and stay in prayer. These are things with your mindset that won't change otherwise. Um, third off, fellowship with Christians. Hebrews ten twenty five. A lot of people um, have this idea. That they can um, make it as a Christian without going to church, without you know being involved with anybody, and of course within a few a few years they're just in a very stagnant place. They don't do ministry, they don't talk to people, they they don't have the joy of the Lord. Well, why? Well, gee, I don't know. See you know what I mean? It's things that we're not meant to meant to live in isolation. Now, Hebrews ten twenty five says this. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Um, I, it always makes me laugh when people are absorbed with the end times and study the end times, and they don't go to church. So you're seeing all these signs about how the end is very close. Okay, and what are you doing with that? So I mean, so you're not going to church. Exactly. You're not going to church. Exactly what it told us to do. Go meet with each other. So I mean, not doing that. But then I don't understand how that fits. Um, experience added to study. Get out. Get past your desk. It's good to be at your desk and studying, but don't spend your life at your desk. Okay? It's good to have the answers to give to people who are who are who are people who are seeking in and want those apologetic answers. It's good to have those, but don't stop there. Get out. Go outside. Go talk to people. You know, uh, and you know, oftentimes this is how you will lead people to Christ. Going to men's meet at Alamar's and ending up just talking to people. You know, like somebody brushes your shoulder and you just start talking to them. It's not something you intentionally have to go out and, 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 and hound people down at their front door or something. Just, you know, it's a natural thing that happens. But sometimes, you know, God will call you outside of your comfort zone to go specifically talk to somebody about Jesus. That will happen. Um, however, don't underestimate uh, your lifestyle. So there is a balance there. It's not wise to do what the Jehovah's Witness do and only go door to door. But it's not wise to do what a lot of modern Christians do and only expect for your for your lifestyle to be a testimony. 
those are extremes. See what I mean? Neither of those extremes answer all the problems. There's a middle solution that, that, that's brought about through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, experience needs to be added to study. Well, exactly what Serena was talking about. Knowledge without experience is just simply knowledge. And oftentimes, as with the case of the person who's never parented that's giving you parenting advice, it can be... It can have that that blind spot that you don't even see as the person who's giving that knowledge about something you don't understand, to where your knowledge could technically be faulty, and you don't know because you have that blind spot there. See what I mean? And it's the exact same th same way when we're giving knowledge, not just for these people who are giving knowledge to us. When we're giving knowledge to people, and we have that blind spot there, you know, because all we have about it is the knowledge. We know we don't have that experience to level out on it. Um, so, anyways. Uh, challenge your beliefs and judge yourself. This is very difficult to do because as Christians, we get into places that we're very happy being at. We think we're, we're, we've arrived. We think we're at a very comfortable place to be at. Whatever. Um, and so it's very difficult to um, you know, to be in a place where you're constantly examining your thoughts. Like what I do is if I've held a view for too long on something, I go and restudy it. I think of autism this way. Well... Let's let's test that theory. Let's see what the opposing people believe, what the people on the other side of the argument believe. I believe this way about um, I don't know if you have a personal opinion about, but like people who you work for, you know the the handicapped, you know. I hold this view about um, about let's I don't know if I can say your say his name with it being recorded, so I'll say Harry. Um, I, I I feel this way about Harry and being uh, what is it called uh, paraplegic or whatever. Um, so I'm gonna challenge my view on that. See what I mean? And what if I'm wrong? Let's see what other people have to say about this. Um, let's say I don't. Let's say you have a, a strong stance about abortion in a certain way. Okay, um, I need to go look up what other people are saying. My enemies, the people who disagree with what I'm saying, I need to go see what they're saying and challenge my belief. See what I mean? And why do this? Why challenge your beliefs all the time? Because you will get a very closed mindset. You won't listen to anybody else. You'll get this is how it is. This is no, I'm right. See what I mean? And even if new study is brought about in the future, you won't even pay attention to it because – no, it doesn't matter. I'm right. So if you're right, there's no reason of challenging uh, – the, the challenging, challenging your view isn't wrong, right? Because you're right no matter what, so, so their view will, will eventually be disproven, right? See what I mean? Challenge your beliefs, the things that you hold most dear. I think that people could just um, – I don't think – I think that welfare is a good, a good idea. What do the people against welfare say about it? See what I mean? Listen to their views. See what I mean? Whatever it is that you're passionate about, find what somebody else thinks that disagrees with you and seriously consider it. In this way, now I gave practical uh, things like paraplegic, autism, uh, those other uh, – but, but I'm talking more about um, you know, theological matters you know, like abortion and those kinds of things. You know, um, but with that being said, you know, constantly challenge your beliefs. But don't just challenge your beliefs. Judge yourself. You know what I mean? When you say something, when you do something, when you're thinking something, judge yourself. Is this right? Is this godly? I'm not just talking about the bad things, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm such a screw-up. I'm such a failure. What does the Bible say? Okay, that would be an example of the negative. But also on, on the positive side, you know. Um, let's say, for instance, at the Christmas party... Um, I was irritated, and um, when somebody asked me something, I shot my mouth off about something that I shouldn't have. Hypothetically, loudly, it wasn't hypothetical, I did that. I was irritated, and pastor asked me something, and I said something very rude very loudly. See what I mean? Judge yourself after that. Was I right in doing that? See what I mean? And then judge yourself. Honestly, judge yourself. And then, once you reach a conclusion based off the Bible and reality, not your bias, not how you want to feel about something, but how it actually is, then make it right apologize, stop doing whatever it is you're doing, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, let's say, for instance, um, every Thursday I go out and get hammered drunk. Well, as, as I start growing in the Lord, I, I well, is this a good thing? Well, no, I don't think this is a good thing because the Bible warns so much about being drunk. I, maybe I shouldn't do this. It talks about being sober and all these different things, being alert. Maybe I shouldn't do this. See what I mean? So I'm judging myself. I'm judging my actions. Does that make sense? Let's say... Every time I get out of, out, of, out of another loan, like let's say I pay off my school loan, so I take out another loan. And I have this habit of just always wanting to be more and more in debt. I want, so I just buy on my credit card. And as a result, I have you know two or $3,000 on my credit card that I can't pay off. So judge yourself. What does the Bible talk about debt? 
Is this right thing or a wrong thing to do? See what I mean? Judge the things that you do and verify. Worst comes to worst, you were right and you wasted time studying. Worst comes to worst. But what if you are doing something wrong? See what I mean? Don't reach that place of this is my plateau. I'm comfortable here. I've got the solutions on all these different things. I have absolute knowledge. Never reach that. Never reach that. I know exactly what I believe in predestination. But I go and study what the Baptists believe. I go and study what, what the Reformed Church believes. I go and study you know, what the Jehovah's Witness teach. I want to know these things to challenge my beliefs. Does that make sense? Because if you get yourself closed off in a box, first off, you're not going to be able to help anybody. Second off, you won't help anybody. Even if you were able to help somebody, you wouldn't. Because, once again, you're alone in your principles. It's, it's all the world is against you. You know what I mean? Um... So anyways, 1 Corinthians 6, 6 11 says this, um, and, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Um, in Psalm 119, 9, this actually might be the passage that I just talked about, uh, about keeping your way straight, uh, the young man keeping his way pure. Um yeah, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according um, by guarding it according to your word? See what I mean? Well, what's he talking about? But weighing the things that you do with the word, the weighing the things that you believe and and think and and you know what I mean? So um, I hope that that challenges you to get out of the bubble of your mind because your mind becomes a bubble if you let it. Anything, any topic, topics as as um, well, like the ones I talked about. I, I think I gave a wide enough variety where you'll be able to at least get your own ideas. Um, you know, and we just kind of isolate ourselves in that because we get comfortable with what we believe. We we don't like to be wrong. You know, we have that everybody has that that prideful attitude in themselves somewhere. You know, where they just don't like to be wrong. And not only that, but we don't like change too much. So once we get things figured out, we like it to stay that way. You know, um, like for instance, I feel a certain way about homosexuality. And then they do another study or something, and they find out that it's genetics. Oh, well, that, 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 that challenges what I believe. See what I mean? So research it. What do, why do they say that why do they say that that's the thing? Do they have actual proof? Do they not have proof? Find out. S understand their view. Read the article rather than just breezing through it. And then see what the Bible says and if it's in conformity with the Bible. See what I mean? And then challenge your belief. So... Um, so the conclusion of the cults leads somewhere around this. The farther down you get, the farther away you get from from the Bible and from correct doctrine. Okay, the farther up you get is the closer you get to correct doctrine. Now somebody asked me, you know, why don't we talk about the Catholic Church? And the reason why is because the Catholic Church uh, has anybody seen seen a corgi? It's when you have a bunch of bunch of cores and they all just kind of bundle together. You can't get them unknotted. It's just a terrible disaster. He knows what I'm talking about. It's a disaster. A complete... Oh, it's just terrible. That's Catholic and Catholicism. There are some people in the Catholic Church, for instance, that believe that they're saved simply because they were born into a Catholic household. There are some who believe that the works will save them. There are some who, who pray to, to, to Mary and angels and all that nonsense. There are some who are genuinely saved. So you can't possibly talk about the Catholic Church as a whole. It's very difficult. So there's somewhere down here for us. For us, okay? I'm not trying to make this us against them or anything. But in, in, in this is the traditional Protestant view, okay? Protestant is here. And we have a certain belief on the Trinity and salvation, right? And that sets us apart from everybody else. Regardless of how we feel about the Bible, this is what we believe in the Trinity and salvation, okay? Salvation through Jesus Christ alone, Trinity being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's Protestant, okay? Um, Catholicism, a lot hold that. Some add things to salvation, and some treat Mary as though she were a mini-god or demigod, whatever. Um, see what I mean? So it's really hard to equate them. So I put them here because they're not exactly on the same theological basis with us, but not all of them are wrong. See what I mean? So they're not... Eh. Then cults still use the Bible a lot of times, and as we talked about with the witnessing thing, a lot of times they'll use the Bible, but they use it in an immoral sense. But then there's other religions who sometimes even talk about the Bible, like uh, the Quran, and you know they do with uh, with uh, Muslims, you know uh, 
but they're definitely farther off base than the cults are because the cults just misinterpret. They um, just simply acknowledge its presence. Then there's the religionless, like the atheists. Okay, these are people who you would think that they're the farthest away from God, but they're really not. Um, in fact, just the testimony of them being religionless is oftentimes testimony enough that they're in a space, in a space of spiritual searching, regardless of whether they don't even realize it or not. Um, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Um, so they're here because they don't even acknowledge the, this. They just think, you know, hey, whatever, the Bible is just wrong, there was, or there was no Jesus, or whatever. But then on the other side, the complete opposite of us is the occult. And those are people who worship the exact opposite of God, be it, you know, uh, a certain angel or, or, or Satan or themselves or whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, they worship the exact opposite. Okay. Now, obviously, you can see how the occult and the cult have a lot in common because in changing the definition of God, you've actually created a different God. Where So in a sense, they are a part of the occult, in a sense. However, I put them up here because they still do use the Bible a lot of times. So as you can see, um, it's easier relativi in relativism. They look this way. Everything can be united except for these people who are saying that they can't be united with people. See what I mean? So we're kind of in a bit of a pickle in that, because that, that's how they see it. That all these things can work together, and these people would too if they would just follow the flow. But see, how we see it is, okay, here we are here, and unless you conform to these two things at least, we have nothing to, talk, we have nothing to agree on. See what I mean? Um, and so then the Catholics, you know, more or less, and so the farther we get away from this, the, the more obscure we are, spiritually speaking. Um, this is, we can be united with other Protestants, Baptist, uh, AG, whatever, Okay. But then, you can only be united with some of these, none of these, none of these, none of these, none of these. So the conclusion of the cults, doctrine is absolutely essential. Not be only because it affects your behavior, but because God himself uh, mentioned, um, sorry about that, uh, God himself mentioned the importance of belief. You know, those who call on the name of the Lord, this, you know, if you call on my name, um, so, anyways, do you guys kind of see that? Any questions? Comments? Concerns? Comments. Yes, comment away. Well, just going back to what you said, because you made a really good point about sometimes, you know, that someone that does not have experience can still give you advice and it still applies, mm -hmm. you know? So don't, you know, be so closed off to what people say just because they don't know, mm -hmm. you know, be, just because they don't, you know, have experience or whatever. And, um, and that was a really good point. I think what's important to note with that is if you're the one that is giving advice, um, it's all about the delivery. <laughs> yeah, it is. Advice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> we all have you know, we all have knowledge you know, that we exercise, you know, with the intention of, of, of extending that knowledge uh -huh. to be beneficial to someone else. Right, right. But that is, like you said, where, where uh, or like you affirmed, that wisdom should always, you know, back your knowledge. Because God can tell me to take... God can tell oh, I see me where you're going with this. to say something to somebody that I know nothing about. Yeah. You know, so when you're approaching somebody to give them advice or whatever yeah. about something, it's important in the way that you deliver that advice yeah. by first saying, yeah. I don't have kids, but yeah. I feel like this would be helpful to yeah. you. You could take it or leave it, you know, but it may be something you could try. I feel like if people would have approached me more that way, yeah. a lot of times I would have been more... Yeah. You know, yeah. open, yeah, yeah. to yeah. receive what they said instead of like, what do you know? Because any, you know, anybody can gain knowledge. Anybody can read a book and learn something, but not everybody can be knowledgeable and wise with what they just learned. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So. I that reminded wanted, me of something that Chuck said. Oh my gosh. I just wanted to add that in about delivery of what you're saying yeah. and, and how you say things, and that's also where arrogance comes in. Don't be arrogant. You know, because we have to understand that pretty much anything wise or smart we say is probably not coming from us anyways, because we're just not wise in our own human 
capacity. Mm -hmm. um, our wisdom comes from God. So don't be arrogant in, in telling people things and giving them advice like, I'm so smart and I'm so good. And, you know, be humble about the, the, the advice and wisdom that you give people. And they will be much more open to receive them. You said something about delivery, um, about the way something is said. Yes. No, not you, you. Oh. Um, and it was really funny. Um, and when Serena was said that about delivery, it, it, I was like, oh, my gosh. And now I can't remember what it was. Did you say something during lunch about um, the way something is said maybe a couple days ago? Um, oh, my God. something about uh, text can be interpreted. Oh, no, it that's something not something to do with the text. Oh, I wish I could remember what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> oh, it was so funny. <laughs> oh, man. I think it was Saturday. When you were in your office changing your charge sheets. <gasps> Maybe it was about... <sighs> Maybe it was about, well, I'll just use this since it came to my mind anyways. Um, as soon as I was talking about delivery, and, uh, you know, like, when, um, when when God tells you to say something or whatever, you know, and, and, and you go and say it as douche as you can. <laughs> God said that you're sinning. <laughs> ha! Got one over on you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the thing that just... told me what it was. <laughs> <laughs> right? And he told me what it was, and let me tell you. Disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could remember. Not surprised. But <laughs> yeah, not surprised, just disappointed. But I was disappointed in you anyway, so... <laughs> I really wish I could remember what you said. I don't even remember. <laughs> There's something about uh, the way something is said. And I, uh, anyways, so next week we'll talk about the minister who quit. Um, and that will be the last lesson of the year, you guys. Yeah. We've talked about all those cults. We've talked about prayer. In fact, remember at the beginning of this year, we were actually talking about something completely different than we did for the rest of the year. We started talking about prayer, and you remember all that? And we were on prayer for like four or five weeks. Um, and we got into um, the passage in like John or wherever the heck that one was. What? Oh, yeah. If only I would have recorded those ones, right? Uh, man, what else did we talk about at the beginning that, that was so off topic from what we were talking about now? Right, I just feel like we went through this limbo in the study. Do you remember that? I think James got us way off. It did, didn't it? But it was after James, though. That was included with the prayer thing. But then after the prayer, we went to something else. And uh, Well, anyways, now I'm getting off topic on this lesson. Um, and then we talked about the cults. Um, we spent a lot, a lot of time Jehovah's Witness. Um, to only two weeks on Mormonism, um, Christian Science a week, you know, all those other ones that we talked about. Um, we talked about a lot about uh, uh, different apologetic things, uh, like those top ten Christian questions Christians hope no one will ask. What a terrible name to say out loud. Top ten, qu top ten questions Christians. You know what I mean? This is, uh, um, then we talked about um, witnessing and and, and we t oh, that's what else we talked about. Uh, knowing your audience and, and doing demographics of the cities that you live in and figuring out, you know, yeah, you remember that. We talked about all the different things like that. Um, well, anyways, uh, 